Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate you staying involved, staying in touch. Uh, I know that our, uh, our church is not in our building right now and many of you are choosing to watch at home. We're glad you're watching. We're glad you're staying connected to the foothills. But more importantly, that you're continuing in your walk with Christ. This, that's what it's all about. You know, just serving Jesus, walking with Jesus, growing in the Lord. And hopefully today, uh, this message will help in that. Uh, we, we're in this uh, sermon series on the book of Romans. We're going to take you through each chapter and the highlights, the two main themes of each uh, chapter in Romans. Um, but um, we're just believing that God's going to make everything beautiful in, in, in its time and that he's, he's in charge of us. He's in charge of, of where we meet. He's in charge of who attends. You know, I, I was reading in Psalms chapter 127 this morning and it says, unless the Lord builds the house, or unless the Lord, yeah, unless the Lord builds a house, it's, it's builders labor in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, it's watchmen stand guard in vain. So God ultimately is in charge of our life, right? He knows the way we take. And so we trust in him. And uh, so given that, let's bow our heads and, and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you make everything beautiful in its time. And Lord, I thank you for our attorneys and, and their commitment to Christ, but they're also their commitment to the Foothills Church of Gilroy. And uh, Lord, I just thank you. I just pray that, that you would continue to lead and guide our attorneys in, uh, in this um, um, fight that we're in and that you would give them wisdom and direction and, uh, and Lord, hopefully a, 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 a God-honoring resolution. Uh, that's what we're praying for, Jesus. And I, I pray that you would anoint me today as I preach and that you would anoint all the ears that are, that are listening today so that we can hear what your Spirit has to say to us, your church. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Romans chapter 3. A couple of the, the, the most famous verses in Romans chapter 3 is, there's none righteous, no, not one. That's verse 9. And then verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then verse 24 says, and all are justified freely um, by God. And so we want to talk today about an eye problem. Uh, not this eye problem, this eye problem. There's a big difference, okay? So uh, Romans 3, 9, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Are we any better? I mean, I serve Christ, you serve Christ, but are we any better than anyone else? Sometimes when people follow the Lord and they serve the Lord, they start getting to think that they're better than everyone else. And that's not necessarily true. Um, we, are, we are better only in that we recognize our sin and have confessed it to Jesus. That's, he makes us better, but we don't make ourselves better. See, one glaring problem with people, especially in our world today, is this opinion that God grades on a curve. And this is, what that is, is the moralist view. A moralist is someone who believes that because they're a good person, they'll be fine in the classroom of life or in God's classroom. I'll be okay. I'm fine because I'm a good person. Well, what does that mean? You're a good person. It certainly doesn't mean that you've never sinned. We're going to talk about that in a second. You see, God's way of grading, though, is not on a curve. His way of grading is pass or fail. It's pass or fail. Like we talked about last week, it's not personal, but it's very personal. And you either pass or you fail. To pass is to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will pass. To fail is to reject God or to ignore God. So if we break just one law, we're a lawbreaker. I mean, I've heard people say, well, it was just a little white lie. It was a lie. A lie is a lie. There's great lies, there's little lies, but they're lies before God. And so, because if you break just one law, then you are a lawbreaker, we will all be found guilty before, before the judgment throne of God. Well, our saving grace is that God is also very loving. He's not just the judge of humanity. He is the loving judge of all humanity. And that is significant. God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then Jesus went on the next verse from John 3, 16 and John 3, 17. Jesus says, for I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. There's the loving act of God and the loving act of Jesus, our Savior. And so, because of Jesus, we can all pass. We all pass through Jesus. We all fail without Jesus. I love what Paul said, and it doesn't really apply here, but it applies here. It's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And one of the things that I can do, one of the all things that I can do through Christ is stand before God. I can stand before God, not on my own merit, but because of Jesus. We pass through Jesus. Now listen, our life's purpose, why we're here on earth, is not to make money. We're not here on earth to have kids. We're not here on earth to get married. We're not here on earth to, to have possessions and, and, and to achieve Though all those things are a part of life, but our primary purpose, our primary purpose in life is to find God. Accept His ways as right, and then try to be like Him. That's our primary purpose for living. Find God, give your life to Him, acknowledge His ways as right. How do we do that? Reading the Word. I read the Word every day because I want to acknowledge that I don't know the way to go. I want God to help me. This morning in Proverbs chapter 20, uh, I read that, that God gives ears and eyes. We have ears to hear and eyes to see, and they both come from God. And so I wrote in my journal today, God, give me eyes, give me ears to hear what your spirit has to say for my life, for our church, for, for the, the, the people you've put in my life, and then give me eyes to see your word and to understand your word. That's our purpose in life, is to find God, accept His ways is right, and then to adjust our life to Him, to be like Him. But I have an eye problem. An eye problem. Not this eye. This eye. And my eye problem is pride that leads to sin. And if you look at the word pride and you look at the word sin, right in the middle of both of them is the word, the letter I. I is the problem in pride and I is the problem in sin. So we have this I problem. But here's what John the Baptist said in John chapter uh, 3, verse 30. I love this verse. John had this great ministry baptizing people. Uh, the, the whole nation was, was like reforming back to God, right? Because there had been so many years where there was no prophets and, and, and they call it the, the, the years of silence. From Malachi to Zechariah, there was really nothing. And then Zechariah was given this, this uh, vision from an angel that they would have a son. He would be the forebearer of Christ. His name, then they were to name him John. Well, he became John the Baptist because he baptized people. And he was telling people to repent and turn from their ways because the kingdom of God is near. And John the Baptist, by the way, is the first one to declare Jesus as the Son of God. He declared him as the Lamb of God who takes the sins of, of man away. And so, once John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, Jesus came out and started his ministry. So you have John the Baptist's ministry happening and Jesus' ministry happening. Well, all the followers of John the Baptist started to go to Jesus. And some of John's disciples said, look, John... All your disciples, all your followers are starting to go after and follow Jesus. Like, we got to do something here. We're losing members. And here's what John said. He, referring to Jesus, must become greater. I must become less. That is, that is a word for all of us. Jesus must become greater in my life. I must become less. As I become less, I will have less pride that leads to sin. And so, I must become less. Jesus, become greater in my life. That's our prayer. That's our prayer. See, but our pride and our sin, they're opposite of that prayer. Pride and sin says, I must become greater. I must get more. I must be on top. I must be first. I must be right. No, no, Jesus is first. Jesus is right. 
It's Jesus. He's number one. Everyone else is a distant second. And so, sin, it's a universal issue. This I problem, pride that leads to sin, it's a universal issue. As Paul points out in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter how high you can jump, you can't reach heaven. It just, it doesn't matter. All of us fall short. So Paul indicts everyone who's ever been born on planet Earth. We're all sinners. All. All sinners. So there's none righteous, not one. Likewise, in verse 10 through 18, here's what Paul says about humanity. Here's what Paul says about, about people a thousand years ago, people 6,000 years ago, people today. He says this, we are all under the power of sin. The power of sin is great. Even when you've given your heart to Christ, there's still this power of sin in us. And we have to, we have to work through and deny ourselves, right? And we have, to, we have to pursue righteousness because the power of sin is prevalent in all of us. And then he says, there's no one righteous. No one understands God and no one seeks him. He also says, we have become worthless. We do no good. We're deceitful, foul, and bitter. Wow. Well, I know that I have the capacity for all of those things. But I'm trying to stem that tide of the power of sin. I want to seek God. I want to do good. I want to, I want to find my worth and my value in Jesus Christ. I want to be honest and truthful. I, I want to be, I want to be um, a forgiver, not bitter, right? In conclusion, Paul says this in, in, in Romans 10, uh, 3, 10 through 18. He says, misery marks our way. Have you ever heard someone say this? Because I've said it. And I've had people say it to me, especially when they're going through a hard time. What would I do if it wasn't for Jesus? How would I make it if it wasn't for the Lord? And then there's sometimes the question, how do people live day to day without a relationship with Jesus? Well, let me tell you, misery marks our way. And the way of peace we do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Well, I want to declare today that I am righteous but I'm not righteous on my own. I am righteous because Jesus is my righteousness. He is and has become my righteousness. I am righteous in Christ. In Mark, unrighteous. Misery marks my way. The way of peace I do not know. I do not understand God. I do not I do, not do good. In Mark, the I problem. I am without hope. In Christ, I'm righteous through Jesus and the blood he shed. So according to the Bible, going back to the moralist view that I'm a good person, not according to Romans 3 or not, none of us are. There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So according to the Bible, the moralist belief that man is inherently good is inherently wrong. Now that's not a popular thing to say because our United States of America believes that we're, we're a good nation and that we're good people and that man is inherently good, not according to the scriptures, not according to the Bible, which I believe is true and the truth. The Bible says we're sinners. When you recognize that, then you understand that there's a unifying solution. It's a universal problem, but a unifying solution. Because here's what verse 24 says. Okay, 23, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24, and all are justified freely by His grace. Next week, we're going to talk about grace from, Je from Romans chapter 4. That grace is our guarantee. But all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus.
So just as all are pronounced guilty before God, an offer is made. Jesus made Nicodemus an offer. When Nicodemus asked him about, about being saved, Jesus talked about being born again. And he was struggling with the concept of being born again. And that's when Jesus said those famous words, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. And so there's the offer. It's an offer from God. Believe in my son. Believe in the son that I sent to die for you, and you will be saved. It's quite an offer. And this offer remedies the verdict. What's the verdict? From the judge, the loving judge, but the judge nonetheless. All are guilty. All have sinned and fall short of his glory. But we're justified freely. Now the word justified, and I've used this before, but I love this, this way, of, way of putting the word justified. It literally means, it's a legal term. So it, it's because it's a court situation. Standing before a judge is a court situation. So this is a legal term that means it's just if I'd never sinned. Justified, never sinned before God. When I gave my life to Christ, all these sins that were mounted in me and, and, and upon me were transferred to Jesus who took them all and cleansed them by his blood. And then God, according to Isaiah 43, said he blots them out of his memory so that he remembers them no more. And so it is just if I'd never sinned. How can that be? How can that be? Because I know I've sinned. And there's sometimes I'm haunted by some of the sins that I committed before I knew Christ. And sometimes I do things now and, it, and I'm convicted and I feel guilty. And I know I've sinned. And when I ask God to forgive me of a sin that I know I've already asked him to forgive me for before, then I'm thinking, God, do you listen? Are you, are you tired of forgiving me of this sin? I mean, you know, when does it end? But with God, it's just if I'd never sinned. That's the power of the blood of Jesus and the righteousness that we've been given. It's the power of His grace. And remember, it's by grace that we're saved. And it's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast. That's, full, that's uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. So it's justified never sinned before. Now, all our sins have been completely expunged from God's records. That's amazing. How can God do that? Well, the only explanation we have is that he's God. He's God. He's able to forget forever, to blot them out of his memory. I can't blot things from my memory. Smells, sights, sounds can bring me back years to something I've done. My memory has a, has a file of everything and things, you know, can, can spur a thought and a, and, a, and a memory. God can wipe it from his memory. And so he wipes our sin from his memory. Now, this is because of the word atonement. It's the only time the word is used in the New Testament is, it, is in right here in, in um, Romans chapter 3, verse 25. It's because of atonement. Here's how I like to think of the word atonement. At one meant. A-T-O-N-E. M-E-N-T, at one meant, atonement. My sin separated me from God. The blood of Jesus, the atonement that he brought, made me at one again with God. That I am not separated from him any longer. I'm with him because of Jesus, what he provided on the cross. You see, sin ripped us off, and it also ripped us away from God. Sin rips us off because it th we think if I do that sin, it'll make me feel good. It'll, it'll make me happy. It'll, it'll put me on, uh, on top. It'll make me first. It'll, it'll make me right. And so sin rips us off. It deceives us, but it also tore me away from God. It ripped me from the presence of God because God can't dwell with sin because he's holy. Just like light dispels darkness. 
Darkness can't dwell where light is. It's impossible for darkness to dwell where light is. It's impossible for sin to dwell where God is because of his holiness. And so my sin ripped me away from God. But the at-one-ment, the atonement of Jesus brought me near, back to God. So the only way to be one with God again is through Jesus. Again, it's through Jesus. It's always through Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. So the cure for our disease, which is sin, the eye problem, is a blood transfusion. I need the blood of Jesus. It's the only way. It's the only way that I will be welcomed into heaven is because I have received the atoning work of Jesus. Here's this verse, verse uh, 25 in Romans chapter 3. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. It's by faith that you've been saved. It's by faith in Jesus, what he did. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads. I'd like to pray with you. If you've never confessed Jesus as your personal Savior, you need a blood transfusion. You need the blood of Jesus to course through your veins and rid you of your eye problem. And Jesus will do that willingly. It's an offer that's free. Here's my offer. The verdict, we're all sinners. The offer, free. Justified freely by His atoning work, his sacrifice through the shedding of his blood. What we have to do is confess. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. And I I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. I believe that you died, that you were buried, and that you were raised to new life. And I believe that it is your blood that washes me clean. And so, Father, Forgive me. And Jesus, come into my heart. That's your prayer. It's a, it's a simple request from a free offer from God. Believe in Jesus and not anything else. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of today's message. We love you and appreciate your support. God bless you and have a terrific day. Hi, I am Pastor Joni. I am Pastor Mark's wife, and um, thank you again for joining us today. If you responded to the invitation to give your heart to Jesus, to join the family of God, then first of all, yay, we are so glad that you did that, and we know that God will bless you. But we also want to just say we would love to hear from you. If you have any questions about it or... um, want to just let us know that you responded, please call the church cell phone or drop us an email because we would love to just encourage you in the next steps of walking with Jesus. So praise God. We love you. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the family of God.